Welcome to Wisconsin DNR's Wild Wisconsin Off the Record Podcast. Information straight from the source. to another episode of Wisconsin DNR's Wild Wisconsin Off the Record Podcast. So as a reminder, this really gives us as DNR staff an opportunity to give you an inside look at work done in the field, in the office, how we work with partners in the public um, to kind of do the work with, that we do and how it connects to your time in the outdoors. So today we have a really good one. Uh, we've got four guys here. We're going to talk pan fishing in Wisconsin. Um, if you've ever fished or ever thought about fishing, chances are you've had some connection to panfish, bluegills, crappies, anything like that. So we're just really going to give a basic overview of kind of pan fishing in Wisconsin, maybe some tips, um, tips by season, tips by tackle, things like that. Um, so we've got four guys with us today. We've got Zach Boyack, the Oneida County Fisheries Biologist, Travis Modal, uh, the Dodge and Jefferson County Fisheries Biologist, Patrick Short. The Mississippi River fish biologist, that's a lot of ground to cover. Um, Tom Schweifel, uh, the Wisconsin Conservation Congress delegate. So three DNR guys and we're happy to have a Conservation Congress delegate here too. I think he'll give some really good perspective. So what we usually do to start with these is maybe give the listeners some background, um, kind of what makes you guys tick, uh, what you do at the department, how it, how it all connects maybe to the subject we're talking about. So. Zach, I thought we'd we'd start with you. So, uh, what's your history fishing? What do you do with the department? Kind of, how's it come full circle for you? So for me, I'm a Wisconsin native. I've been with the department uh, about four or five months now, and I grew up fishing Wisconsin. And as a fisheries biologist or uh, biologist, the manager, uh, part of my job is to help uh, ensure that the panfish populations are healthy, so we can catch the fish. Travis, how about you? Uh, so I've been with the department uh, permanent since 2010. I was biologist up at Plymouth for uh, about seven years. Now I'm at Horicon, so I manage a couple of, uh, well, a, a handful of uh, really productive shallow waters, uh, very popular for pan fishing. So it uh, really connects me with, uh, you know, the, the work that I do on the team here and uh, a lot of different, uh, your average angler, I would say, is is a uh, really good connection with pan fishing. Mm -hmm. And what's the team you're referencing? Is is there a, a pan fish team? Yeah, absolutely. The So each species in the state has a, a statewide team where there's representatives from all over uh, the state. And uh, the team I was referencing was, of course, the the best team, the pan fish species team. <laughs> I've heard comparisons to the Avengers, but I, I didn't want to <laughs> say anything. But Patrick, how about you? Uh, also a Wisconsin native. I've worked for the department for almost 20 years on the Mississippi River. Um, my area of operation would be from about La Crosse down to Dubuque. Anything that has to do with fisheries, we're managing. We do a lot of habitat projects on the Mississippi River. Uh, the habitat is degraded over time, so we kind of rebuild what was there back in, let's say, the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and it's there to basically make fishing better. Panfish is one of the you know, probably best species to go and fish on the Mississippi River and a lot of people actually come to the river to fish for those species. Tom, how about you? Well, I grew up pan fishing from the time I could dig worms. Uh, fortunately, the back of our house wasn't too far to a river. Uh, my brother and I used to go down there fishing and getting to join the Wisconsin Conservation Congress, um, this is starting my third, second year term, has really opened my eyes to a lot of the things that go on in Wisconsin. Um, but panfish, again, as I said, being a young kid that grew up on them, that's my passion. I love catching big bluegills. Um, it's just a fun time, and all it takes is a handful of worms, a pole, and just a good sunny day, and go out and enjoy it. So for someone who may not be familiar with Conservation Congress, can you uh, maybe explain how you fit into all of this? Sure. The Conservation Congress uh, is represented by every county in the state of Wisconsin. Um, Resolution, resolutions are presented um, that may want to have a rule change, 
um, may want to add something new. It's where the public really gets to voice their concerns and their wishes um, to bring to the state of Wisconsin. The state of Wisconsin is the only state in the, the nation that has a public conference or public representation like this, so we're pretty unique. And if you get involved in it, just go to a meeting and, and listen to what the, your neighbors have to say, and you're going to learn a lot. And really, it's a, it's a great opportunity, not just for fishing, hunting, camping, bird watching. Um, it really is a benefit for the state residents of, the, of Wisconsin. Yep, the Congress is a really valuable partner. I think everyone at the table would agree with that. Um, so if you're looking to learn more, you can go on our website and search Conservation Congress. You can find more info there, uh, meetings, how to get involved, things like that. So hopefully that gives um, the listeners some perspective. Kind of as a reminder, we're talking about pan fishing in Wisconsin. Um, you'll hear that we've got a Mississippi River guy, we've got a couple county guys, uh, Conservation Congress. So I, I really think we're going to have a great discussion here with with some good perspective kind of coming from different angles. So I thought I would throw you guys a softball to start. Zach, we'll start with you. What is your favorite panfish to target? Well, for me, I'd say my favorite uh, in the spring would be crappies, and then through the ice it'd probably be perch. And I guess I should probably qualify the question. Maybe we can do it by eating and fishing, if that's different. So I don't know if that's different for you. For I'm not a real picky eater, so yeah, okay. that one, that doesn't come to play too bad. All right, we're in the same boat then. Travis, how about you? Yeah, for me, both eating and fishing, I think it's got to be bluegill. Um, just a deli delicious fish to, to have on a Friday night fish fry. And, um, yeah, fun, fun to catch, fun for the kids, uh, almost a year-round thing, so... Patrick, how about you? Paul, I'm going to have to go with, uh, for eating, it's a tie between perch and crappie. I mean, they really have got some shoulders on them if you're going to fillet them. So, I mean, there's some, some good meat on both of them. Um, catching them, you know, perch I like doing in the spring. They're also very good uh, to catch in the, in the fall during, let's say, the winter ice season. But I really love chasing crappie uh, during the winter ice fishing. So when you say they have shoulders on them, um, for someone listening who may be like, what? the heck did he just say so what does that mean that means uh, right behind the head where they start to uh, basically get a little bit larger there's a lot more meat there that you can flay off so shoulders means just the thickness of meat okay got it keep that in mind as you're listening if fish shoulders come up again so. uh, Tom how about you well I'm gonna go with the bluegill for eating and for for catching um, the eating bluegill that I like is between seven and eight inches but when it comes pound for pound for catching a big bluegill in relatively deep water and he starts pulling and spinning his way up uh, on an ultralight rod, it's tough to beat. It's a lot of fun, and I, I'm going to go with the bluegill. So we got a wide range here. A couple bluegill guys, a couple outliers, one fish shoulder guy. So, <laughs> um, so we covered that. So why don't we talk about, kind of step, take a step back here. What do we... What do you guys, as Wisconsin DNR biologists, what do you consider a panfish? So how does it kind of meet that classification? Well, I think for us, the general definition is sunfish, uh, yellow perch, and the crappie species. So um, if you look in the regs, that's, that's generally what you're going to find under the general definition of, of what a panfish is. Um, and those are, when you look at the regulations, um, those are the species you're going to want to be considering when you're when you're looking at those different regulations. So, some good background there. So, another kind of softball, and this is going to be kind of subjective, but why do people like panfish and pan fishing? Do you think it's one of the I guess most sought after fish in Wisconsin, and they're easy to catch. So, do you think those two are connected? Is it the most sought after because it's so easy to catch, or does the food element come into play, or I think all those come into play. Uh, again, just there's an abundance of panfish. People like to catch them, and they're easy to catch. You can take your kids out fishing, throw a nightcrawler over the side of the boat, and pull in a bluegill. And I think a really interesting aspect of it, too, is the accessibility thing. Like, if you're taking someone new fishing, you're not going to take them road trolling for muskie. Well, maybe you will. I mean, I, I guess that's a, that's a personal... You're setting them up, setting them up for a lifetime of, of agony, probably, but... So can you guys talk about maybe what someone would even need to get in into pan fishing? Like we have the learn to fish courses and things like that, but if someone really just wanted to go to their local pond and cast a few lines and catch a panfish, what I guess what what would be square one? 
and I still use it today. It's um, a little bit more technologically advanced, but it's a cane pole. It's a telescopic one. Basically, it extends out to about 11 feet. I walk along a road where there's vegetation, and I move basically a, a bobber, a slip bobber with a, a waxy on it into areas where there's a little bit of open water. And during the springtime, you can catch some very large bluegill doing that. So you don't need very much. Uh, a cane pole and basically the willingness to get out there and, and buy a fishing license and fish. So realistically, we're, we're talking a pole, line, obviously, uh, worms, a place to fish, but pretty easy to find if you're looking for pan fish, um, and then a fishing license. And if it's your first time, we have cheap licenses for that, too. So um, does anyone have anything they want to add to that? I'd just like to add, don't go too big with the hook. Too often you'll see somebody going out there with the number four, number six hook. Keep it small, especially in spring. Um, a number eight maybe, number 10 probably ideal. Your line, you don't need it much heavier than four pound depending where you're fishing, four, maybe six. When early in the year when the water's clear, you want to keep with a smaller, lighter weight line so that's not as visible to those fish. With a float, if you're using a slip bobber or any of them, use just enough float to stay on the water. So when that fish hits, he's not feeling a lot of resistance and wants to drop the bait. This way it, it will pick up the worm or the wax worm, whichever you're using, and will pull it down easier and you'll catch a lot more fish. So um, pay attention to the size of everything. If you use a sinker, real small, again, big sinkers can scare bigger fish away um, when it comes to panfish. They are very leery of, of big bait, so keep that in mind. So you're telling me that the bigger the hook, the bigger the fish saying doesn't necessarily apply to panfish? Not, pan not in panfish, okay. definitely not. All right, good to know. So how important is panfishing in Wisconsin? We've talked about it a little bit here, but I thought maybe you've got the food aspect, you've got the social aspect, you've got people, whether they're retired or, or young guys, young, young guys and girls going out, casting a bobber, so can you guys just talk about, maybe from your interactions with the public and how you manage the species, how important are panfish to kind of the culture here? Well, panfish are very important to our economy. I believe a lot of the resorts up north um, cater to the pan fishermen early in June. The weather's nice, families are going up for their vacation. The fish are relatively easy to catch at that point. Kids don't have to be quiet in a boat and they can be having fun, dad can have fun, uh, mom will enjoy it as well. It, it's really a family adventure in Wisconsin and it doesn't take a lot. Just keep it simple, go out, have fun with the family and panfish will reward you with that for sure. I, I don't doubt that. Uh, there's nothing more exciting to see your, your young child catch a fish for the first time and it's a nice bluegill or a nice perch or crappie, whichever it is. But as a grandfather, I'm going to say it's even more fun when you get to see your granddaughter catch her first fish. Um, she beats mom at that point, so take your kids out fishing. It is, it's wonderful for the state of Wisconsin. And I think just from a quantity issue, too, you really get an opportunity um, if you are at a, a place with a decent pan fi panfish population, which I think we're going to talk about is pretty much the whole state, but you're really getting an opportunity to pull a lot of fish out of the water, whether you keep them all, obviously... You don't have to, but it's just, I think, that aspect of, especially the way culture is now with instant gratification and things like that, I think it may be harder to get people into uh, fishing, hunting, and all that. So I think panfish is a really good one, and maybe something I would equate to like squirrels or rabbits with hunting, just maybe a good square one to get people into, and then you kind of maybe move up. But um, I get people of all spectrums, obviously, love panfish. So regionally, are there areas of the state that are better than others for certain species or how would you guys address that one? Well, as far as the Mississippi River, I mean, it's, it will hold all species. Uh, I mean, you've got perch, you've got uh, bluegill, you've got crappie, you even have uh, rock bass. There's a number of other type of bass too, whether it's white bass, but uh, there's num numerous species of fish in the Mississippi River, very good access. About half the volume of the calls that I get to my office are people wanting to know what's happening with the panfish and where can they go to catch them. And one of the first questions I ask is, do you have access to a boat? Um, if they don't, there's a lot of shore fishing opportunities. There's also floats or barges that they can go to and fish off of. 
uh, and then if they they have access to a boat, whether or not they know you know how to fish behind wing dams, or if they're going to be open on um, open, let's say flats, mud flats where the fish are actually biting. So there's it's really important because I get a lot of a high volume of calls into my office, knowing or wanting to know where the fish are biting and uh, when are they biting. Mm-hmm. So are there resources out there to um, maybe to to go right a little bit for a second there, what kind of resources do people typically use to find places to fish for panfish? Is it mostly kind of word of mouth or? Um, a lot of times they'll call your local fisheries biologist or a service center. They'll use uh, like in-depth angling, uh, lake link to try and find out where the fish are biting. And of course, um, word of mouth, you know, the cell phone or text, who's catching fish, where they're catching them. It seems to be a big thing right now. Facebook also. Mm-hmm. Do you Podcasts guys- too. Yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. Do you guys find that people are open to sharing their spots for the most part? Obviously, you guys are as staff when they call you, but I think that's an interesting part of it all, too, is do you think people are, are open to sharing their spots? Obviously, if a little kid comes up and is like, where can I catch fish, the guy regardless, or girl's going to be like... More so nowadays than they have been in the past. I think, again, with texting and Facebook, a lot of people are... You know, catching that fish, taking a snapshot of it, and either Snapchatting it, Facebooking it, or, or uh, sending out a text on, look what I caught, and where the fish are actually biting. So it seems to be a little bit more frequent um, these in these times as far as where the fish are biting and when they're biting, people are finding out. You'll sign through at the boat launch. As long as you're polite, most fishermen are more than happy to to share information with you. But again, it's being polite. It's if you come up and ask them, hey, I see you coming in, how was fishing today? And they'll talk. Most of them are going to tell you some things um, in your local bait shop, too. They're going to be able to tell you what's biting, what bait they're catching them on, uh, maybe if there's a depth involved. Well, that, the, the bait shops are there to help you, and they will definitely give you a, a lot of good information as well. So if it happens to be a Sunday, the DNR fishery biologists are home enjoying the, the weekend off, get a hold of the bait shops, check with them, they'll, they'll help you out. So Mississippi River sounds like you're, you're pretty well set if you're looking for panfish. Um, do you guys want to talk to maybe some other areas of the state? Is it kind of the same situation, you think? Or? I think in inland waters there's you know numerous opportunities for different uh, species, different bag limits, um, different uh, experiences throughout Wisconsin. Uh, I think it's pretty spread out. You know, you're not going to get to one area of the state, I don't think, where you're not going to be able to find a pan fishing opportunity, I don't think. No, I agree with that. I think kind of what Pat touched on, like what equipment do you have? I mean, pan fishing can be as simple as you want to make it or as complicated as you want to make it. And if you have a boat, you can reach places other people can't, you know, maybe use some different equipment that other people can't. But then if you don't, I mean, you can still go right on the shoreline and, you know, depending what you're after, you know, nowadays you see a lot of people with kayaks and, and small canoes. That access, access is used to some places where I can't get in with my big boat that have phenomenal fishing, but a bigger boat doesn't get in there. So if you have access to a kayak, you've got some great opportunities. Just make sure you're care, careful with the weather um, if you're out on bigger waters. I fish Winnebago and Green Bay, and I see some pretty small equipment out there as long as the weather's fine. But you've got to be careful that you don't get too far out in some of those places um, and as Patrick says on the Mississippi, it's great, but you got to also know the river and the currents because it can be very dangerous. If you're just a novice going out there and you get pulled up by a dam, you could be in trouble. So um, whatever equipment you have, you have to know your limits. So it sounds like it's really as intensive as you make it, which I think is another good thing um, on the accessibility side. You can make it as simple as you want or you can really, really get into it and get serious. And Zach, you mentioned something interesting there. You said whether you're looking for size or quantity. So do you guys find with panfish that there are lakes that become known as kind of big panfish territory as, as you would have with something like muskie or walleye, or is, is it just kind of evenly distributed that way too? I think some lakes have reputations known for producing larger fish than others, and some have reputation kind of more numbers lakes. Mm-hmm. So what contributes to that? Uh, density mainly in the forage base and if you have a higher density typically the size structure is a little smaller and that lower density typically you have a higher size structure so Mississippi River statewide 
Uh, we've got some input there, and I think this is kind of tough for you guys too because it's pan fishing. They're kind of all over the place, but I figured now we'd get into maybe a little more of the nitty gritty, maybe some of your guys' favorite tactics or some of the more popular ones. We talked about the cane pole, the bobber heading to the local pond. Um, I figured now we'd get into maybe some of the more, we talked about it's as complicated as you make it, maybe some of the more advanced ways that people may fish for panfish. So do you guys want to talk about, first, First, actually I think we should talk about what is good panfish habitat. So if you are coming up to a pond or a stretch of a river and you know you're going to get to fish that area, is there something people should be looking for? Well, I'm going to say, being a, a pan fisherman that I like, and, and I concentrate on green weeds, um, weed edges, weed holes, um, openings in the weeds, and that's whether it's your summer, spring, spring your weeds are going to be knocked down, or winter. If I can find green weeds, I'm always going to find panfish. More often than not, it's going to be bluegills and perch, but there will be some crappies and bass in there as well. But um, I, you can go out and drift um, over the, the deeper water in the hot summer, but I myself, I'm always going toward green weed edges. So Patrick, I think you were going to add something there too. Well, again, it depends on the time of year. You know, usually uh, um, shallow bays where there's weeds in the springtime where they might be spawning, if that's where you want to uh, basically catch them on spawning beds. Um, during the middle of the summer on the Mississippi River, we're usually looking towards the main channel behind wing dams. And then once ice sets up, we're looking at uh, backwater lakes, areas where there isn't current. These fish, whether it's uh, crappie, bluegill, or, or uh, perch, they need to get out of the current. So if you're finding current, that's not where you're going to find the uh, basically your panfish species. They're backwater lakes, usually uh, four to six feet deep, uh, where there's going to be some vegetation and uh, sufficient ice that will basically hold someone when you can walk out there. Those are usually the areas that I look for. So you mentioned a wing dam. Can you explain maybe a little more for someone listening who may not be familiar with that? Uh, the wing, a wing dam is located on the navigational channel. So that the navigational channel is where most of the traffic goes through, where most of the flow comes through. And uh, a wing dam is a rock structure that comes out from shore, perpendicular to shoreline. And what it originally was there to do was to push water from the side of the shoreline out to the main channel so that when navigational traffic was coming through there was a deep area. So you have these wing dams on both sides of the main channel that force water to the center for navigation. And behind those are good places to actually fish for bluegills. And are those fairly common would you say? Or? They're up and down the Mississippi River. So on a, a large river like the Mississippi River they're, they're, they're very common. Mm -hmm. On large rivers like the Wisconsin I, I don't believe that there are any wing dams. They're mostly let's say, uh, sandbars that are out there. You might find some natural structures, but the wing dams I'm talking about on the Mississippi River are man-made structures. Okay. So how about lakes? Do you guys maybe want to touch on that? I would say that uh, a lot of times a good thing to look for is some kind of structure, whether that be coarse woody habitat or maybe some man-made structure like a fish crib or a tree drop. Um, you know, any kind of structure in the lake usually is holding some kind of fish. Um, because it provides a, you know, a refuge or a cover for that fish. So, um, in general, some kind of structure is a good thing to look for. And Patrick, you mentioned um, four to six feet earlier. Is there kind of a best management practice as far as what people should kind of look for? Because you can see the water, you can see the weeds. Should they be trying to get near the bottom with their bait, or does that kind of vary? Or do you want to touch on that maybe? Sure. If you're fishing on the Mississippi River, a lot of times you're not going to be able to see the bottom. I mean, it's usually, if you have uh, two to three feet of visibility, you're doing really well. It's A lot of times it's less than that. And four to six feet of water is usually what I'm targeting for for during ice season. So for um, panfish fishing during these backwater lakes areas uh, during the winter time. Anywhere from, let's say, 10, 12 feet during the summertime and probably maybe four to six feet, four to three feet during springtime. So there's, it depends on the time of year of the depth of water you're going to be fishing. So does that mean you want to be closer to the bottom or like on the edge of the weeds when they come up or is, is, is there something you could tell someone maybe looking for more info about that? Uh, definitely I would say during the s summertime you're going to be a lot of times deadlining so you're going to be pretty close to the bottom. 
uh, during the winter time when you're fishing, or let's say ice fishing, I fish the entire water column. So from the bottom up to the right to the bottom of the ice. And is that deep water, is that due to water temperature or forage or? Uh, probably forage based. So food? Yep, food okay. usually something that's drifting along the bottom, that's what they're gonna grab. Okay. So how about bait, tackle, or if you're a fly fisherman, can you guys maybe talk about, we talked about um, kind of for the, the novice, the smaller hook is usually better, but can you guys maybe talk about some of the baits or tackle that you'd recommend for someone? Um, maybe we'll start with uh, soft water, so when there's not ice out, is there is there some kind of baits that you guys would recommend based on species or however you want to cover that? The classic would be basically um, hook and line uh, and a night crawler or a worm. Otherwise, uh, that's open water. You could also use a jig and a wax worm with a with a bobber, slip bobber. I've used that also. Um, dead lining is usually just a line on the bottom with a sinker, and then of course you know you have a bobber that's attached to it too. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any tried and true? Mm, nothing to add except the the classic crappie minnow too. Along, that's one of my favorites. So live bait. Yeah. I would add uh, giant trout worms or big reds they're called. Um, hooking them, I hook them in the summer. Um, I will use an ice fishing jig. I hook them once right through the center. Um, and usually they're so lively, they're just squirming and wiggling around in here. I don't put any weight on that. When I throw it out, I let it float down, it's wiggling, and that fish could come up off the bottom or maybe when it hits the bottom. Um, but you're only going to catch one fish on one of those worms. Um, usually once that worm's been hit, it's almost dead. Best off, throw it off, put a new one on. But they do really love, in the summer, they love giant red worms. So I guess in, in a general sense, would you guys recommend live bait over artificial, or does it kind of depend on the situation? Or it, it really depends, again, if you're ice fishing, nowadays most guys are using jigs and plastics. Very few guys are even using live bait and ice fishing. Summer fishing, some people use plastic yet, um, but I still, it's tough to beat a worm. Um, again, that giant red worm is my number one go-to bait. It's really always in my boat. So something, oh, actually, I thought we, we didn't talk about fly fishing for panfish. So is that, does anyone have any experience with that? Uh, it's a specialty spot, sport, basically, at that point. You're looking for, you got to have a lot of room. Um, it's just not something that's as common, but it is, if you catch them on a fly rod, it is a lot of fun. I will say that much. I've never done it, but I know people that do do it, and usually when there's a mayfly hatch on the Mississippi River, those mayflies, as they emerge and they become adult, winged adults, they move over towards, let's say, trees and branches. They get so packed onto these trees and branches, they literally hang down into the water. So people that are targeting bluegill or crappie, uh, they're, they're actually tossing these right next to trees where they're covered with mayflies. And I'm guessing that the fish think that a mayfly is dropping in the water when that fly hits, and they're pulling them out. They can be productive. Um, again, it's one of those things I just haven't really targeted panthers with. So it's it's one of those things that um, situationally maybe to keep an eye on if you know there's a mayfly hatch happening, maybe get it out. Um, but other than that, Correct. so hopefully that gave a good overview of kind of the rig these guys recommend for getting started. Um, so we talked about this a little bit, but I thought maybe what we would do um, is maybe go through the year by seasons and maybe you guys talk about kind of... Um, the big picture things, uh, maybe where to target panfish, how to fish them. So I thought maybe we'd start with spring. So do you guys have any thoughts there? Springtime, I usually try and, at least on the Mississippi River, uh, as the water's coming up, these fish are moving up and following the water. And they're going to be finding areas to spawn. Once the temperature hits probably closer to 60 to 65 degrees, that's where I'm walking around with, a, again, my telescopic cane pole, 11-footer, extended out. I use two-pound uh, two test power pro with basically a jig and a, a waxy on the end and a really small wire hook because a lot of times as I'm dropping it into little areas as I'm moving around, I'm snagging things. And as with that power pro, which is a, let's say, mono, it's not monofilament, it's a braided. spider web braided. braided. You can... Uh, pull on it and that little wire hook is going to bend out and you don't have to snap anything and also if you're grabbing a fish you can when you're pulling it out it'll bend a little bit and put it back together and just keep on moving on from little hole to little hole. So did anyone else have any thoughts on kind of spring pan fishing kind of what the main things maybe you'd focus on? Uh, like 
Pat said, that warmer water temperature, you know, the shallower bays, darker water, that's typically where they end up targeting them. They're moving in there, just like you said, following the water. I'm fishing them basically two weeks after ice out. I'm looking almost in the same place as they were at last ice. Um, I fish southeastern Wisconsin quite a bit, and it's just a matter of um, finding some holes in the weeds again. I'm, I'm going into where there's a lot of dead weeds, um, some green weeds left in there, and you get in there on a calm day and you can see the holes. Uh, I fish with a 10-foot ultralight salmon rod with a bobber set at about four foot. I'm probably in five to six foot of water, and all I'm trying to do is get that, that bait to fall in those little openings. And I'm using a giant red worm again. And it, when you find them, they're in there. Um, but again, it's not far from where they were at late ice. So that's one thing maybe we didn't talk about too. So do our panfish generally, do they school up as far as how they're kind of navigating a body of water? Are they typically in groups or? I find them in groups based on the habitat. So they're in there and grouped up because of where the habitat is. Not that they're following around in a group of, let's say, 100 fish per school. Mm -hmm. It's usually there's habitat that's attracting the fish, and the fish are there because of the habitat. Mm -hmm. So how about summer pan fishing? Do you guys have any thoughts there? Is it different than spring? or Different than spring. Um, again, on the Mississippi River, we'll target areas. That usually have lower water, so um, the backside of wing dams. Uh, mud flats, and then also Travis had mentioned earlier, there's a lot of trees that drop in. If you can fish that structure, usually going to do pretty good, uh, at least finding bluegills and maybe getting snagged up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And as for, uh, for, for lake fishing, you've got a couple options in summer. You can start, once the water gets up into the 80 degrees, you can go over and start drifting the deep water. Um, anything from, I'll just say for instance, if you got a 50 foot depth in the lake, um, set up on the upwind side and then just start drifting across, set your bait down anywhere from about uh, 14 to 17 feet down as you drift. Um, you can use an ice fishing jig, you use a little bit bigger split shot or on there for weight, put a worm on, wax worm, at that point the water is warm, the fish are pretty aggressive. Or again, um, I'll fish weed edges even in the summer. Um, find a good weed edge, set up on there and you can either dead stick over the side, just uh, letting the worm hang right down right off the bottom or you can cast that weed edge and just real slowly drag it along the bottom and that'll also produce fish for you. So moving through summer kind of into fall um, are there any changes there as far as so we've seen spring and summer pretty different but probably the baseline of things that may work all year but is there something in the fall that you guys tend to use more than often that may be different? I'll just uh, I'll go back to where I know those fish are going to be again coming winter. They're moving back up toward the shallows. Um, it's almost the reverse of what I did in spring. I'm fishing those same weed edges, same weed holes, um, six to eight feet of water, using the, the long ultralight again, setting that bobber down about eight. If I'm in nine foot, I want my bobber set at eight. I just want to be a foot above the bottom, no weight on. Um, and again, a real lively worm on there, throw that out toward those weed edges and uh, the bluegills are definitely in there. I don't catch many perch or bluegills, or perch or crappies, but I am catching the, the bigger bluegills that time of the year as they get ready to move shallower for, for the uh, winter. So then moving into ice up, obviously ice fishing is huge in Wisconsin. A lot of people chase pan fish on the ice, so um, are there ways that you guys go into it maybe uh, first ice versus last ice, or is there anything that you guys do ice fishing that you feel works well? Look for the group of tents. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and actually, I'm going to kind of go away from that. Um, get on the edges of those groups, but really, it, when I ice fish, and I ice fish a lot, it gives you the mobility. Any, you don't need a boat anymore, but I go out in a shelter. I want it as dark as I can be. I'm fishing shallow water, and I tell people it's like watching fish on TV. You get inside that shelter, drill the hole, wait for your eyes to adjust, and you get to see everything going on when the water's clear, which most of these southeastern lakes are. It's amazing what you get to see. Now you get to see, as Patrick said, or it, the fish could be anywhere from the bottom of the ice to the bottom. And a lot of times people are out there fishing right down on the bottom and they, re they don't realize a lot of those big bluegills, and crappies especially, are literally a foot below the ice. Um, 
by being in that shelter, I get to see that. You can pull the bait away from the little ones. You see how they come in, they react. Uh, if you gotta change things, you can. The fish will tell you what they want, and it can be very frustrating as well, but it's, it's amazing to be inside a shelter and just watch what those fish are doing down there. Um, it's actually quite enjoyable. So a common question we get to on our social media pages is, how, how does one go about choosing um, a spot to ice fish? So we mentioned the shanty thing, oldest trick in the book there. I use that quite a bit, but can you use maps or is there a way for someone, maybe the first time they're fishing a lake and all they maybe have is a map or talking to the guy at the bait shop, is there a way that you go about choosing a spot or is it really just trial and error? Usually uh, early ice, uh, I'll go to the back side of the lake to the farthest part of the lake, at least on the Mississippi River. Those are the areas that are going to usually be the warmest and it seems like those fish try and concentrate in those areas. And as we go throughout winter, there's going to be less oxygen in, in those backwater areas closer to shore, so they're going to be moving away from that. So initially close to shore in shallower water. and then. One of the things that I normally do is, you know, I use my Vexlar and I kind of move it around and I'll just find shooting through the ice where I see where I'm marking fish. And that's where I'm going to set up. Drill a hole, I put on a weight, I usually use a four foot rod, drop that lure all the way down to the, the bottom, find out where the bottom is, pull it up, pull the weight off, and then I'll start right from the bottom of the ice and start moving it down. And this is my technique and it seems to work for me, but I'll do little bitty drops. So a little one, two, three, so it only drops maybe about an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch three times, and then I drop it down about two inches. So one, two, three, drop down two inches. One, two, three, drop down two inches. The slower that you do, the less active the fish will, will usually bite. If they're really aggressive fish, you can do that fairly quick. As I work that way down to the bottom, then I'll start working my way up. If I do that twice and I don't get any fish, I move to another hole. And that's usually my technique for moving around. So it sounds like early ice you're looking looking for more shallow water and kind of back bays or correct okay and is is that because they want that warmer water still or that, that's what I found out okay. is that that they wanted that warmer water and then there's more there's there's still very good oxygen back there but it, and as you move throughout the winter time and you get snow on the ice well then you start to deplete that oxygen and they're moving towards area where there's greater oxygen by looking at a map you can get pretty much of an idea by looking at the contours if you're in Say your shoreline comes out uh, six foot and then you start dropping down. With a little bit of knowledge, you can, or you can even start to look at it, you can figure out where that, them weeds are going to come out to and then just keep working off them, them weeds until you hit the edges of that or where you hit openings because they will hang around those weeds. There's going to be feed in there, there's going to be cover in there, and those weeds are still early, are still producing some oxygen. Those fish are going to be around that. And then later on ice, then you start moving out to little deeper water, you look for submerged um, bars, uh, different long points, certain things like that. You look for gravel possibly later. Um, you just got to kind of work it in reverse in the winter. You go from shallower to deeper. So Pat, you mentioned a Vexlar, so I think that kind of brings us to our next point. Um, how do the use of electronics, and by electronics I mean electronic uh, depth and sonar tools, how does that fit into pan fishing? Or how do people typically use those, maybe by ice versus soft water? Well, I think they probably use them, um, at least a depth finder, both open and uh, hard water, and probably a camera. Sometimes they'll also use during hard water. They may use during soft water too, uh, but it's it makes it you know, it's very effective for targeting panfish. Um, if you know where the fish are, then that's a good place to start. You don't have to try and figure out where they aren't. Do you guys think from what you've seen that a lot of people are using electronics to pursue panfish? I yeah. think there's quite a few people, especially, you know, they, you can get a unit for relatively cheap and just it's very effective and you see your buddy catching fish and he's using a Vexlar and you're not and it might be a perception thing or, or not, but if you think it's going to help you catch fish, a lot of people I think are using them. So for the DNR guys, are there opportunities for the public to get involved or provide feedback? Is there management plans or something like that for panfish that kind of come into play here? Well, as you mentioned also with the Conservation Congress, every year we have those meetings uh, in every county, and that's a great opportunity for people to at least start and get involved as far as the process. Um, I went out uh, two years ago uh, onto a lake and helped them do spring netting. 
and help measure fish in that. You know, I'm just a public guy in the public, and I ask if, if there's something I can do to help. And they were more than willing to have me come out. They needed the help. It was actually very enjoyable to go out and see the walleyes that were in this particular lake and see what else was in the nets when we pulled them in. Um, I got a different appreciation for what they do when it's a cold April day and you're out there in your waders pulling in these wet nets and realizing how much work it takes to do it. And they have to go out there and do that every day during the spawning time. So uh, I just called the, the DNR biologist in the area and asked if they could use a hand and they were very uh, receptive to me coming along and helping. So maybe something to consider. And even just to get the dialogue started, um, getting in touch or getting to know your local biologist, kind of getting a feel for what they're doing to improve your time on the water, I think is some good perspective for people to have. Um, like Tom mentioned, there may be opportunities to get involved with actual management activities, Conservation Congress, things like that. Um, so does anyone have anything else, maybe some closing thoughts to add? Maybe we'll go around the table before we wrap up here. I think kind of what we just touched on, uh, your opinion counts, so let us know, take opportunity of the surveys that come out or the spring hearings and the meetings and really, you know, voice your opinion. And I would say, you know, as a biologist, we, we often have large coverage areas, so if as an angler you're seeing something strange or something that you don't think is right, I, I definitely would contact your local biologist because we can't be everywhere all the time, mm -hmm. so we often rely on public reports to uh, to let us know on something something that that needs to be addressed out on the landscape, and we can get out there and take care of it. I just want to say, as a conservation congress and as a public citizen, the DNR does a lot of wonderful things for the sportsmen in Wisconsin, and we don't see half of it. Um, we we really need to appreciate the work that they do for us because they are helping make uh, fishing and hunting in Wisconsin much better. And if you're out there fishing, uh, you don't need to take your bag limit every time. You know, take enough for a meal and leave some for the next guy. Some good closing thoughts there. I think the main th main themes here is the accessibility of pan fishing. It's a really a great way to get involved in the sport, and there are plenty of resources out there to help you get involved. Um, on our website, working with local DNR staff, uh, people like Tom and the Conservation Congress, I'm sure are always happy to take people out. Um, so really just a great way to get involved in fishing. So thanks again for joining us for this episode. Uh, we covered pan fishing in Wisconsin. Look forward to doing more of these with some of the other fish species. I think this one I think is difficult for you guys just because it's such a general species and it's Wisconsin is such a good state to fish for pan fish. So I think I've put you guys on the spot a few times. So some difficult questions there, but I think this is a really good starting point for kind of helping people get to know our fishery staff, what they're doing, and, and kind of the resources that they can offer. So you can find this podcast and all the other ones at dnr.wi.gov, keywords Wild Wisconsin, on our YouTube channel, WIDNRTV, um, on our iTunes and Stitcher channel. You can search Keywords Connect on our webpage. And then always remember to check out our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter pages, share your photos, share your videos, share your stories. Um, other than that, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Wild Wisconsin Off the Record.